computer. Okay, so now I'm I'm recording it, but you can record it too, because there could be a power outage or my solid state hard drive could melt or something before we can put this online. So you're you're welcome to to record it also. Um, okay, so let's look at the uh, the material for today. So if you've been kind of lost. Um, things are gonna change a lot starting right now because we're switching from symmetric key cryptography to public key cryptography. And public key cryptography is much different. Um, oh, sorry, I'm gonna click on things and not realize that you're not coming along. So please yell at me if I do that accidentally. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, okay. So I'm I'm uh, I'm looking at this on my on my PDF annotator, but this is also on CoCalc and slide form. So if you go to um, your slides slides directory, you should see day twelve. This is day twelve. Who knows what day this actually is? It's probably pretty close to day twelve. Maybe it's day fourteen or fifteen or something. Um, okay. So here's the here's the plan, and maybe we should just explain how it is that we've been doing symmetric key cryptography and, and what that is. So you know, when we've been using AES, there's been like a certain key, and you use that key to encrypt a, a message X. And it's also true that um, when you want to get X back, you use AES with the exact same key, but you use it in decrypt mode. Um, so it's uh, the symmetric and symmetric key. What that means is just that the encryption key is the same as the decryption key. And you know, it it didn't occur to, to any human being ever. People have been using cryptography for thousands of years. And as far as we know, nobody had the idea of making the encryption key separate from the decryption key until like the early 70s. But I guess you had to have, um, you didn't actually necessarily have to have computers. It's just it never occurred to anybody. Maybe there just wasn't an application for it. Um, so there are actually a lot of problems with uh, symmetric key cryptography. I mean, it's fine for like uh, conspiring to kill the king or something and you need to, you know, party A needs to secretly correspond with party B. Um, but if you imagine working in like a modern company with 10,000 employees and you want to do um, pairwise encrypted communications between each of the, the 10,000 employees. <laughs> That's a lot of keys. So if there, let's just say that there are four employees. Um, if there are four employees and any two employees need to be able to privately communicate, how many keys do you need? Let's count them. One, two, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Three, four, five, six. Um, okay. So with four people, you need six keys. I use this diagram to, as an intuitive proof that uh, polyamory is not a good idea. If you have like, this is couple one, and this is couple two. You have four people. There are six relationships that all have to be good. I think it's a bad idea. Don't want to offend any polyamorous people in the class. Um, but that, that goes up quadratically with the number of participants. And you probably know that the formula is n times n minus one over two. Um, so this is the same thing as n choose two. Um, so if you have n participants in, uh, in, in your company and, and you, want, you need a, a unique key for each pair, you need that many keys, which is n squared. So if you have 10,000 um, 10, employees, then um, that's 10 to the fourth. So you need 10 to the eighth keys, which is um, 100 million keys to keep track of and also distribute and also refresh periodically, which is a nightmare. Um, and uh, so 
uh, well, we're not going to say exactly how public key solves that problem right now, but we will in a second. There's also the problem of, of key distribution. So let, let's say that um, me and Fernando want to have encrypted communications with each other. Um, we need to exchange a key so that we can use AES, but we don't have an encrypted channel over which to communicate to exchange a key. So how do we share the private key in the first place? It has to go by like trusted courier or something like that, or we just have to risk it on the first try or something. So um, how does that happen? So public key cryptography also solves that problem. So it among it, it's just like it allows us to do so many things like you probably heard of digital signatures it's what makes uh, cryptocurrency possible and all kinds of um, all kinds of cool new new technologies um, so but those are those are two problems two like fundamental cryptographic problems that it takes care of key distribution and uh, too many pairs of keys Here's the, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Here's the slide on pairs of keys. So for 10,000 users, you need 500 million keys. So here's another problem with, um, with uh, symmetric key cryptography. If you have Alice communicating with, uh, with Bob and um, maybe Alice tells Bob uh, you can have my car. So she says something like, my car is yours. And um, Bob takes this seriously and he goes out and he drives the car and he crashes it or something. And then Alice says, why did you crash my car, Bob? And Bob says, because you gave your car to me, Alice. And Alice says, no, I didn't. And then Bob goes to a judge and he says, look at this. I have an encrypted communication from Alice and it says, my car is yours. And it's encrypted using the secret key that only Alice and I know. So what is Alice's lawyer gonna say then? Why is that not proof that Alice wrote that? Um, get the key somehow? It, it's, um, Bob could have forged it because Bob knows that key too. So both Alice and Bob know the secret key that they use to communicate. So just because Bob has a copy of a message that's encrypted with that key doesn't mean that Alice wrote that message. It could also be the case that Bob wrote that message and now he's lying. Um, but in public key encryption, that's that's um, not possible. And you can actually use a digital signature is just a document that's encrypted with uh, with somebody's so-called private key, and that is admissible in court because when you have uh, an encryption key, which is the private key, and then a, a decryption key, which is the public key, and they're separate. Um, there's only one person in the entire world that knows the private key, and that's the, the user, him or herself. Um, so it stops this problem of non-repudiability. So that means that you can't take things back. And um, that's why it's important for um, blockchain, where you can make uh, commitments that you're not supposed to be able to later renege on. Um, okay. So the basic idea is that there are two keys, one key for encryption and one key for, for decryption. Um, and often these are called the, uh, the, the public and, and private keys. Um, so if you just consider Alice, Alice is ready to communicate here and she has one key, which is uh, key, pro key priv. Um, so nobody knows this, but Alice, this is her her key that's used just for um, decryption. Okay, so only, only Alice can decrypt her messages. But there's another key called uh, key pub, which is Alice's public key. And the public key is used for encrypting messages to Alice. And Alice doesn't care who, who can encrypt. 
all she cares about is who can read her messages. She doesn't care if a bunch of strangers send her encrypted messages or not. So this uh, this public key, the encryption key, she can go and just put this like on her her MySpace page. Or what are you guys using now? It's not MySpace. It's face 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 something. My face. She can put this on her Facebook profile or her web page or her Instagram or something. It doesn't matter. It's totally not secret. So the public key um, anyone can have. It's, it's just the private key that's private to Alice. And it's important that no other human being knows Alice's private key. Knowing Alice's private key is kind of the same as, as being Alice. And in the future, our identities are almost certainly going to be managed that way. You know, now what 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 is it that makes you you? If you have to prove that you're you, you to get a driver's license, you need like six documents or something that all kind of suggest that you're you. That's stupid. <laughs> in the future, you're going to have just a, a private key, and the person who knows that private key is is you. Um, uh, uh, you know, like you, this, the the level that this technology is at compared to where it could be is so frustrating. Like when you go to a doctor's office, how do you prove that you're really you when you go to a doctor? You're the only person who knows what. Mm. What do they always ask you? Social security number? Yeah, social security number, but often it's just your birthday. Like you're the only person in the world that knows your birthday. It's dumb. And then social security number two, that's another one. So one, one thing that happens with social security numbers, there's no way to prove that you know your social security number without revealing your social security number, right? Same thing with your credit card. You can't give somebody your credit card number for the purposes of paying them without also allowing them to make charges on your credit card. All of that is dumb and completely unnecessary and almost certainly will change in the future if society survives the next 45 days. Um, so there's, there are ways to prove that you know numbers without revealing the numbers. So here's, um, here's Alice's private key. Suppose that she wants to prove that she knows it. Well, anybody can use uh, Kpub, right? So you just, um, you use Kpub and then you make up some random number R and you encrypt it and this becomes Y. And so then you give Y to Alice. So send Y to Alice. And then you say to Alice, hey, Alice, if you're really Alice, what is R? And then Alice says, well, I'll happily tell you, I'll just decrypt that using my private key. Um, and then Alice knows R. And then she'll just, send R back to Bob or whoever. So that way she's able to prove that she knows the private key, which is just a number, without revealing what the private key is. Um, so obviously that would be great if you could, if you could, you know, pay for something using your credit card without also revealing your credit card number. You can. It's just that um, people's habits and uh, traditions have not caught up to what cryptography can do. Um, Okay, uh, often people use a mail slot as a metaphor to explain this. So it's like um, anybody can put mail in a mail slot, but only the person who has the key to the door can read the messages. So the, the mail slot is sort of like the public key. Anybody can send an encrypted message, but the key to the door is like the private key. Only one person can open the door and actually read what's inside. Um, and public key cryptography solves these problems that we just talked about. So let, let's go back to um, here. I, I guess I like this problem better. Let's consider the number of keys problem. So let's again, let's, now let's suppose that we have um, a bunch of people who want to communicate. And maybe there are five of them. So if we're using public key cryptography, how many and, and any two people can communicate um, privately, then how many keys do we need? Before, it was one key for each pair of people, right? But what is it now? Now it's two keys per person. 
because each person has a public key, which you use to send them messages, and they have a private key, which they use to read their messages. So now with five people, instead of having, um, what is five choose two? Five choose two is five times four divided by two. Um, so this is 10. Um, so instead of needing 10 keys, you actually need 10 keys, oops. So it actually turns out to be a tie for five people. But what about for 10,000 users? For 10,000 users, you need 20,000 keys. So 20,000 is way, 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 way less than the half a billion keys that you needed before, right? So it increases linearly with the number of users instead of quadratically with the number of users. So that's a big advantage. Um, and what about the, uh, the, key, the key distribution problem? So let's say that I want to send a message to, um, actually I have the, I happen to, happen to leave campus with the attendance sheet by some miracle. So what if I want to send a message to Samson? Um, how do, how does Samson and I exchange, what would I do? I would go to um, Samson's uh, Facebook profile and there Samson has posted his public key and I use that to encrypt a message to him and then I send him the, the message. And uh, then he uses his private key to decrypt it and then he goes to my Facebook profile and he downloads my public key and then he uses that to encrypt his response and then he sends it to me and I use my private key to read that message. And we've communicated and we um, see that, so there was no issue of some kind of secret courier that carried a key, you know, handcuffed to his wrist or something like that because we only needed the public key which anybody can download from the Facebook website. So it's a, it's a beautifully elegant solution to the, the whole problem. There is one issue though, which is when I do that, how do I know that that's not like some weird clone of Samson's Facebook page? In other words, how do I know I'm not being like fished or something? I might think that that's Samson's Facebook page, but it's really somebody else's Facebook page and it's their public key, then when they get that, when they get my message, they're going to use Samson's real public key to forward the message to him. And Samson and I will think that we're communicating, but really there's some uh, enemy who is in the middle intercepting and reading all of the messages that Samson and I exchange. So that's called a man in the middle attack, which we will talk about in depth later. And it's a, it's a serious problem with uh, public key cryptography, but there are solutions that work. Uh, you know that they work because public key cryptography is, is what the internet runs on. So it must work pretty well because that's the reason you're able to do online banking. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and not, only, not only that, but um, suppose that we, we just want to use AES. You might wonder, if you can do all the stuff that I'm talking about, why does something like AES still exist at all? We haven't, it's not clear, but maybe somebody can think of a reason. Why do we still need AES if we can do all that stuff using public key? Maybe it's faster? Yes, it's faster. It's like a million times faster. Um, these, uh, these public key tricks, they use like huge numbers, like numbers that are on the order of like two, two to the 4,096 or something. So you need to like multiply and divide numbers that, that are this big, like a thousand times and stuff like that. And it's just super slow. It's like, uh, it's amazingly slower than a uh, symmetric key. So often what you want to do is some kind of hybrid approach. And this is the way HTTPS works. Um, so what you, what you do is you use public key um, to exchange a symmetric key. So, um,
So in that that example that I was talking about, where I was communicating with with uh, Samson, um, instead of sending him a message, what I would actually do is I would randomly create using a, a true random number generator. I would create an AES key for the two of us, so 128 bit AES key or whatever. And what I would actually send him is using his public key. I would send him send him an encrypted version of that key, and then he would. Um, use that to send me a message that's encrypted in AES using that key, and then I would use that key to read what he sent. And um, then, you know, he and I can exchange like Blu-ray movies or, or gigantic files, and it goes really fast because we're using symmetric key. Yeah, okay, and then non-repudiability. We've already kind of talked about this. So this is a, this is like a challenge and response scheme. Um, this is how you know those like um, those key fobs for your car that unlock your car when you get close. They could work this way. I don't think they actually do work this way, but your um, your car could have the the public key for a private key that's on your key fob, and it could send your key fob a challenge number, like um, some challenge statement is like. It could be a phrase in English, but it's probably just a random number. So the challenge statement gets sent to the uh, the key fob or whatever, and then um, the person who's challenged has to use their private key to decrypt it to some number s, and then they they reveal s, and that proves that they know the private key without revealing what the private key is. And this is basically how cryptocurrency transactions work. Um, the, the history of public key cryptography is interesting. Um, so there are, you know, several people that can claim to having, having invented it. One person is, is Ralph Merkel. You should follow these, these links. Mer Merkel is also just like a, a very smart, very interesting person. And I, whenever I see Ralph Merkel in like a podcast or something, I always download it because he always has an interesting point of view. I'd love to hear what he thinks about coronavirus and everything that's happening right now. <clears throat> but when he was an undergraduate at, um, at Berkeley, he had the idea of public key cryptography and he handed it in, uh, or I think he gave it to his professor as a project proposal. And his professor said, uh, you know, Ralph, uh, revealing the key uh, in cryptography is not such a great idea, you know, F. And he, he finally, he find, and then he, he wrote it up and submitted it to a journal. It was rejected from the journal. And he, he actually got rejected from two journals. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I mean, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't probably explaining things very well because he was just like a 20 year old kid and it was his first paper and it probably didn't sound smart the way he was doing it and stuff. but. Also, he had no reputation, but eventually people figured it out. There are these two guys, um, Diffie and Hellman. So they're, they're very famous and they will be famous for all time because they invented something called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, which was really the first useful public key algorithm. And we're gonna talk about that in, in detail you know, over the, the coming days and stuff. Um, the, the idea that Ralph Merkel had, um, it wasn't as good. What he could do is he could he could make it so that you and I could communicate using a certain amount of effort. And then in order to eavesdrop on what you and I were saying, an enemy would have to do quadratically more effort. So if you and I had to do 1000 steps, the enemy would have to do a million steps. But that's not a, that's not enough of a burden for the enemy because people can do if you can do n, then often you can do n squared also. So what you really need is for you and I to communicate, it, it costs us n effort, but then for the adversary, it's two to the n effort. So that, that works well. And that's what, um, what Diffie and Hellman came up with. And this paper, you'll find like it, uh, often the very first paper on a subject is, um, in some ways easier to understand than the textbook because it, um, they wrote it for an audience that knows absolutely nothing about what they're talking about. So they explain every, every little detail. 
And you can still download the paper and read it there if you want to. And also um, later, like uh, some people, especially people in the British government involving a cryptographer named Clifford Cox later claimed that they knew all about this stuff and but they couldn't reveal it because it was classified. But that might be true. And it might also be true that they're exaggerating and that they didn't really realize the implications or have a, a scheme that worked as well as like Diffie Hellman Key Exchange. So public key cryptography is, is based on um, one way functions. So you have uh, you you have y is is some function of x. Um, so from x you can you can quickly compute y, um, but to get x back from y is very hard. Um, and I just became aware recently that there is a really great, some, some Wikipedia articles are, are better than, than others, but I just want to show you this, this thing from, from Wikipedia really fast. Everybody still awake? How are you doing? Everybody okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, so I'll share, is that my email? Should I show you guys my email? Let's go here, okay, get that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna Google um, public key cryptography. Um, by the way, what I'm what I'm using here is the Brave browser um, and DuckDuckGo, and I'm not like a privacy nut, but it is much more private than using, um, say, Chrome and Google. Nobody is spying on everything I do. Maybe that doesn't bother you very much, but um, Brave and DuckDuckGo are are working really well. I just want to come down to this sort of historical statement by this guy with this awesome beard. Where is he? I don't know. Oh yeah, this guy. Um, there he is, William Stanley Jevons. Are you guys also looking at this? Yeah. Okay, cool. So there's William Stanley Jevons. You know what FRS means? Anybody ever seen that before? It means friend of the friend of a, the Royal Society. It means that <clears throat> you're like it's like the scientific version of being a knight. And he um, in this 1874 book he said, "Can the reader say what two numbers multiplied together will produce the number?" Blah, 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 blah. I think it unlikely that anyone but myself will ever know. So can you guys solve that problem? <laughs> Um, can, I, can I do a new share? Oh, let me copy, copy this number first. Let's figure it out. We have to know, right? So I'll copy this and then um, and let's do a, a new share and we'll just look at some terminal window. It's going to work. Oh, okay, that's for some other purpose. Let's go here and I'll just type factor. Are you guys looking at, what do you see right now? Terminal window? Yeah, terminal. Okay, cool. All right. And all right. So the numbers are 8961, um, 89681, and 96079. Um, so now we, we can figure that out because we have computers. And I am convinced that there's a, there's a, a method of factorization that was invented by Fermat that you might be familiar with from calculus. I mean, you might know of Fermat from calculus one. And I think it would have worked to factor a number this small, but still there's no denying that, um, that factoring takes a long, long time. So this is sort of like one of very few examples of um, an algorithm that is um, a one-way function. So multiplying two numbers together to get uh, a product is very fast. Um, how long does that take? That takes like, I think, n squared time. Oh, you know, this is actually an interesting subject of research and it's just recently been improved on, like as in last semester, um, the time it takes to multiply two n uh, binary, two, two numbers that whose length and binary are n, how long does it take to multiply them? So the, the, the algorithm that we learned in elementary school is an n squared algorithm. That means for, you know, for every, digit in one number, you have to consider every digit in the other number. But there are faster ways. I think they get it down to like 1.4, uh, 2 to the 1.4 
no, no, wait, n to the one point four, something like that. Anyway, it's um, it's short. It's a polynomial time algorithm where the exponent is small. But what is? How do you factor? Um, so you can you can try all pairs of factors, but um, I feel like I'm going to be boring you here. Let me just say that you can factor in, in time that is a little bit faster than exponential time, but um, but slower than polynomial time. That means it's worse than any polynomial, but not as bad as two to the n. So they call this um, sub-exponential running time. And I noticed that Fabian has been asking questions. Oh yeah, Fabian asked if he could ask if he could record it, and then you guys did ask me. And then somebody said that they want to kill me and that they know where I live. Let's go. Um, let's go back to the slides. Where are we? Right here. Yeah, and time is flying. I'm sure it is for you guys too. Can you guys believe that you've been listening to me talk for an hour? No, it goes a lot quicker here. Um, it doesn't feel that long. Okay, yeah. good, good. Because I thought maybe it was quick for me because I like to talk, but slow for you because I'm just saying a bunch of bull crap. No, it's just as quick, I think. <laughs> Um, so often the, the existence of these things depend on this famous conjecture, P versus NP. Have you ever heard of that before? Um, mm. This is maybe, I think so. this is one of the most famous problems in mathematics right now. The, the most famous problem is probably the, the Riemann hypothesis, which was the, the problem that John Nash was trying to solve in A Beautiful Mind, which still nobody has solved. But um, this one is, is just as famous. And if you can solve it, they'll give you a million dollars, but it's also like the hardest way in the world to make a million dollars. Um, and what it basically says is that some things are hard to do. <laughs> um, you know, like, uh, do you, have you guys ever studied the traveling salesman problem? You know what that is? Well, that sounds familiar. It's like, um, if you have um, some cities and then each each city is uh, connected. Is like Hamilton pots or Euler pots or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, these red dots are supposed to be cities, and then I'm 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 trying to draw all the connections possible between all the cities, but I might be missing some. Um, and each each um, each one of these connections has a certain distance. You know, like maybe this one is 50 miles, and this one is 100 miles. And the question is, how do you visit every city? in the shortest amount of time, uh, the shortest, you know, the shortest trip. And it turns out that there's nobody knows of a way to do it that is significantly faster than just considering all possibilities. Mm. Um, and in fact, it's, it's NP complete. So what N, NP complete means is there are a whole bunch of problems that are known to be in this problem class called NP. And if you can figure out a way to do this quickly, then you can also do any one of those other problems quickly. And it basically, if, if it's true that, that P is actually equal to NP, it basically means anything that, a lot of things that seem to take exponential time can actually be solved in, quickly in polynomial time. Um, so it's almost certainly true that P is not equal to NP, but we don't really know. Um, and it comes up here because this statement here is computationally hard. <laughs> So for something to be computationally hard, you know, computationally hard things sort of have to exist and that's what P not equals NP says. So here are um, some examples. Uh, one of them is just, is just factoring. So given two large primes, um, how long does it take to, to multiply them? Not much time. How long does it take to factor N back into P and Q? It takes a long, long time. Um, but this is one one interesting thing with uh, quantum computing. So um, quantum computers can, I don't know if it is um, linear time, but uh, I think uh, quantum computers can can factor a big number about as fast as a classical computer can multiply the factors. Um, so if anybody ever succeeds in, inventing a quantum computer, then it will immediately break 
um, most of the public key cryptography that, that exists now. And people have some ideas about what we could replace those algorithms with, but they're not really as nice as what we have now because already for the public key we have now, we need numbers like for, uh, we need like numbers like this. So this is a, kilo, a kilobit, right? Or four, four kilobits. So this is a four kilobit key. And then for the quantum proof cryptography to do public key, you need keys that are like several megabytes. And that's just kind of sad, but that might be what happens because it, it does seem like quantum computing is, is developing. And um, it, uh, you know, five years ago, nobody was sure if it would ever be possible. And some people are still skeptical, but big companies are investing huge amounts of money in it. So people that are a lot smarter than me seem to think that it will realistically happen soon. I mean, soon as in like within 30 years. Um, here's another hard problem, um, given N. Um, so computing X, I guess given N and X, then it's easy to compute X squared mod N. But um, if you're just given Y, how do you take the sort of the discrete square root of Y? If you wanna take the, the discrete square root of Y, that means find the X um, such that x squared is equal to y mod n. And that seems to be a, a very hard problem. It's easy in one direction, but hard in the other. So that's a one-way function. And um, this is the other, this is the other big one. So this is this is kind of equally as important as the, the factorization problem, but it's a little bit harder to understand. So let's say that we're given like a big prime number. Um, what does big mean? Big means like um, two to the 4,096. It used to mean something more like two to the um, 1024, but now this is kind of considered too small. Um, at the end here, we, we see a conversion table. So you can see what, what these sizes mean in terms of bits, like, um, you know, 128 bit AES. That's very easy to understand because to break 128 bit, bit key, you have to do two to the 128 work. And so that, that makes a lot of sense. So how do you convert these huge numbers in, into like number of operations that the enemy actually has to do? So there, there's a table at the end that we'll look at that shows those things. But let's suppose we have a big prime and here's just some also big number X. Everybody gets to see P and X. And now D is a, is a secret and it, um, it's also, you know, really big, like thousands of bits long. Um, then it's easy to compute um, x to the d mod p. It's actually not obvious that that is easy, but there, there's some, there are special algorithms for modular exponentiation that go quickly. Um, and the problem is, if I just tell you x to the d mod p, you tell me what d, and, and I also tell you x, then you have to tell me d. And nobody knows of a fast way to figure that out. Um, the reason it's called discrete log is because that would kind of, what we really want to do is sort of compute log base D of X to the D, except um, not in the real numbers, but in, in, you know, mod P, which is a lot different. So nobody knows of a fast way to implement this function mod P. And here's what I was talking about with uh, key links and security levels. So now we have these huge keys. These keys are like, you know, 4,000 bits long. Um, so what does that mean in terms of the number of operations that the enemy actually has to do to break the system? Because it, it's no longer just um, like in AES, it really is that to break a 128-bit key, the enemy has to do two to the 128 operations, but it doesn't look, work like that anymore. Um, and so that, that's because and public key cryptography, everything is based on solving some hard equation, like for example here, right? Um, so here's the hard equation you have to solve. D equals discrete log of X to the D. Um, so how long does it take to do that? Um, it might be that there's some fast algorithm for doing it, nobody really knows, but um, it's, not, it's not as simple as just like, um, the same, it's not the same as just checking every possible D. So checking every possible D would be like this, but um, there are faster ways to solve that, 
to that equation than just trying every possible d. So here's the here's the conversion table. Um, so if you have uh, with RSA, this is like public key cryptography that's based on factorization. And uh, if you are working with keys that are um, that are 1024 bits, then that's like 80 bits of security. Um, 3,000 bits is like 128. So 128 is um, um, I mean, 80 is good, yeah. What I was going to say is Grover's algorithm will cut 128 and half down to 64, but Grover's algorithm is a quantum algorithm, and if you have a quantum computer, then like no version of RSA is safe anyway. So if you um, if you want to get a, a 192, this is like this, and how is it these things are increasing? I think it's increasing as the uh, I, I used to know. Is it like, I think it's x to the one third power. So the third root or something. So I think this number 80 is kind of like the third root of 1024 and 128 is like the third root of this and 192 is like the third root of that. Um, so these, um, there are other ciphers that are based on the discrete logarithm problem, and they have exactly the, the same. There's some weird relationship between integer factorization and discrete log. So, if you can if you can solve each e either of those problems, then you can break the other. So, if you can factor integers, then you can quickly do discrete log, and if you can do discrete log quickly, then you can quickly factor integers. So there's a connection between them. Um, elliptic curves is not really. This is a little bit misleading. And elliptic curves is kind of a complicated topic. It's a really beautiful topic, but um, we don't talk about it in, in this class. But it, it's um, it's still the discrete logarithm problem. It's just not the dis here we when we talked about the discrete logarithm problem, it was mod p. So this is in a in a group, and the group that it happens in is um, just the integers mod p. So this is the group. You guys know what a group is. But there are other groups, and some of there are groups called elliptic curve groups. And the um, we'll see later that the discrete logarithm problem actually makes sense not just in this context, but in any group. So when they when they talk about elliptic curves here, what they're talking about is it's still the discrete logarithm problem. It's just not in the group z mod p. It's in an elliptic curve group. And these are cool because the um, the key sizes are much smaller. So you get um, you get sort of public key magic, but you still get um, symmetric key key lengths. Um, on the downside, some very paranoid cryptographers don't like elliptic curves because everybody is encouraged to use these standard curves and this, the curves were picked by the NSA. So um, a lot of people think that the curves, the standardized curves that um, NIST told everybody to use because the NSA told NIST to use those curves are curves that were carefully constructed by the NSA to allow them to break the elliptic curve encryption, which very well might be true. Um, okay, and then there's the uh, the statement on quantum quantum computing, which uh, it just says what I said earlier. Um, but now it's more authoritative because we're actually quoting the NSA. It's basically just saying that quantum computers will break public key as we as we know it today. Okay. Um, so what are you guys looking at right now? Do you see me? Anybody still yeah. there? It's like a full screen image of you. What do you see? It's a full screen image of you. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so on, on CoCalc, I thought we would have time to do a little exercise together. It looks like we're, we're not going to be able to do it, but maybe we can do it next time. I'm still going to show it to you, and you, you can play with this on, on your own if you want to. Um, so we'll go back here to CoCalc and wake it up, wake up CoCalc. And I'll come to Activities. And here I have, um, you should have these now. This is a, there's one activity called hard problems. I'm going to open this. Um, 
so all of, all of these exercises use um, mathematical software called Sage, and it's really it's really cool. It's really ideal for a cryptography class like this one because it lets you do number theory, like um, get big primes and and random primes and factor them and and stuff like that. So you can play with this on your own. Just pick a couple of big primes, P and Q, and then see how long it takes to multiply those primes, and then um, see how long it takes to factor those primes. Uh, sorry, factor N. N is the product of those two primes. And this is, this is 72 nanoseconds. What is a nanosecond? Anybody know? It's a billionth of a second. It's like 10 to the ninth seconds. OK, that's more than all. <laughs> but here's a, here's a microsecond. What is a microsecond? A microsecond is a millionth of a second. Um, so, so how do you compare these two? Um, so this one is like 96, 960 million. Oh, I forget. Anyway, it's like a thousands. God, am I really too stupid to do this? Um, so how many, how many, let's, can, let's just work in microseconds. So this first number, 72, what is that? That's 0 0.072 microseconds. And then we'll divide that by 960. And what is that? Um, so this is the this is the percent of time that it takes to do the multiplication um, compared to the time that it takes to do the factoring. I think actually the other way is more interesting. So this will be um, 0 0.072. So okay, so the the factoring is um, thirteen thousand times slower. That doesn't mean that it's 13,000 times slower, period. Both of these numbers change as the size of the primes increase. As the size of the primes increase, um, this number, the time that it takes to do the multiplication, will increase as a square of the number of bits in the primes. But um, this number, the time it takes to factor, will increase I'm going to lie a little bit just because it's um, almost as good as the truth and much simpler. This number will increase exponentially in the number of bits in the primes. So you have um, the time to factor is increasing exponentially. The time to multiply is increasing as a square. So exponential growth is much, much, much slower than, than quadratic growth. Okay. Oh, and here, there's another example here. Here's the ratio of the running times, uh, blah, blah, blah. OK, so um, and here's an exercise that you can do. And I was going to actually ask everybody to do that. And then we were going to do peer grading. But I don't think there's time. Um, but maybe we should just stop there. You guys want to spend like one minute doing that? <laughs> you just take this number and copy it. We'll see, and then type um, factor, and then type it in there. The number, yeah, nine at the end. Okay. Did you get that? I guess. And this is this is a prime factorization. So when we factor something, we factor it into primes. So that's an important thing to to know. Any integer can be written as you written uniquely as a product of prime numbers. Um. It's, you know, you could always write the primes down in a different order, but the, the primes that show up, that's unique to each number. It's called unique prime factorization. So no matter what number you make up. Oh, wow, look at that. I happened to get a really huge prime there. So 233 and that other ridiculous number are both primes. And so this number that I, I wrote here, that's the unique number that is made up of those primes. That's sort of why they're called primes. You can think of all numbers as being built out of them.
Um, and then you can try to answer the second question if you want. I think it takes a little bit longer. So this, this number E and what we've set up here is just like the number of bits in the primes because we're taking a random prime. This could be as large as two to the E. So that's like basically you're taking a 50 bit random prime. So you take a product of two 50 bit random primes. How many bits will the product be if the factors are 50 bits? <laughs> are you yawning? If you multiply two 50 bit numbers, then you get a 100 bit number. So these are, this is a 100 bit and and you'll see that E can, can get pretty big and this can still happen pretty quickly. So um, let's, let's stop there. I hope that wasn't too bad. This is a, like um, my second distance learning class ever. Is it okay? Is the technology working okay? Yeah, I don't seem to have any problems. Okay, it's probably a little bit more boring than class because you can't look at ESPN. Oh shit, you guys can look at ESPN, can't you? God knows what you're doing right now. <laughs> um, so anyway, it, I wish that I could see everybody. Um, I hope everybody is healthy and happy and making good progress on the assignments for this class and understands everything about what's happening with take home one. Um, homework three is due on Tuesday, and I'm I'm you know here on CoCalc, um, ready to help anybody that has any problems. Um, everybody okay? Raymond might be especially tired because he's had to sit through two of these. My back hurts. Does your back your back hurt, Raymond? I mean, I've been moving around as much as I can, oh, okay. so not too bad. But when I sit in the same spot, it gets kind of bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also you're not 42. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so it could it worked pretty well. I'm pretty impressed with how Zoom is working and like the screen sharing. So I think like technically everything's going okay. If you guys are worried about anything and you, you just want to talk about it privately, then you know we can we can set up one of these to do for a private talk. You can email me or or talk to me on uh, CoCalc or whatever. So let's let's do attendance because I happen to have the attendance sheet and it was the 19th. Um, so if you're not if you're not able to talk, then um, just type it in the group chat, and I'll get you there. Okay. Let me give everybody a second to get their microphones turned on. You can turn on your microphone. Everybody, turn on your microphone. Let's see what we hear. It could be interesting. <laughs> this shows people are right, like racing past my apartment. <laughs> like it sounds like I'm at. Like a racetrack. Yeah, you hear people's family members, cars, seagulls. Is this the class where we had the seagull? No, that was the last one, I think. Okay. Yeah, somebody lives near the beach and we heard like seagulls. Also, I don't know if everyone knows when you're muted, I think you can click uh, the space bar, like hold the space bar to talk, like push to talk. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. Um, like old A mutes and unmutes the microphone, I think. Oh, awesome. It's not really muted. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I guess the, the slamming yeah, noise. Exactly the best. <laughs> um, is, uh, is Shipu here? Yeah. Okay, I got you. Um, Ebenezer, I think he dropped. Aiden, I know you're here. Mm -hmm. Tall? I'm here. Cool. Oh, uh, Fernando? Yeah. Got you. Um, Lewis? Here. Got you. Andy is here. Yeah. Uh, Sar? He's here, but he can't talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, Gibran? No, Gibran. Tassadak? Here. Okay, got you. Omaru? And Adam, I see Adam, but he's got his mic muted. I'm gonna get my he wrote there in the chat. Okay. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, Shana. Yep. Here. Got you, Andrea. Here. Okay. Samson. 
Got you. Jake? Here. Uh, Sylvia? I think that's a no on Sylvia. David? She's David? here. Oh, she's here? Okay. She wrote it in the chat. Okay. Uh, Serene? Okay, so I'm gonna say no on Serene. Um, Raul? No Raul. Uh, Nikita? Nikita is here at least once. Okay. Um, Aaron? Here. Got you. Uh, Fabian? Here. Okay. Uh, Raymond is here. Matthew? No Matthew. Um, Catherine? No Catherine? And El Alawi. So if you guys happen, I'm going to say no on El Alawi. If you guys happen to personally know any of the people who are not here, it might mean that they're not getting emails. And if you could, if you have a way to get in touch with them, I would really appreciate it if you would make sure that they are getting the Piazza messages and stuff like that. Professor, did you call David? Uh, yeah. Um, are you David? Yeah, you're David. I've got you. I got you. Um, okay, so that's it. And um, I hope I hope your online classes go well, and the transition makes your life easier instead of harder, and the classes are still good and stuff like that. And I'll see everybody on Tuesday. See you. Have a nice day. Bye, Professor. Bye bye. Bye.